does hurt, and that's hurting him, I think, immensely. I want to bring in my panel, Labor MP Ed Husick, Liberal Senator James Patterson. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Patricia. Afternoon. I want to start with this because I've just talked about it there and of course Jacinda Ardern has found a way to sledge uh, uh, Alan Jones I think in a way that would hurt. He, she's talked of course about rugby. Uh, I'll start with you Ed Husick. Should Alan Jones be sacked? Has this kind of gone on too long these comments that we've heard? Uh, of course previous Prime Minister, a Labor Prime Minister, uh, heard was, was actually the subject of commentary similar. Well I feel very strongly that they were the wrong words entirely. Uh, I completely understand that Alan's got a particular view on uh, climate change. Uh, he and I would not agree at all. Uh, you can have the arguments, but you've got to choose your words carefully. And the thing that I just simply do not like about the words that are used is because while you may throw those words around in that particular way, uh, we should all be mindful nowadays uh, in particular, that you know, having words that have a reference to a, a physical element to them, just not on. I, I don't think you need to use those words. Should I mean, he, Alan, should can... he come off? Should he be taken I'm off not... air, though? That's the key question. Look, I, you know, I often get asked. You've asked me questions on other occasions about whether or not people get sacked or whatever. Um, you know, I, I'm not into that that game. But what I do emphasise, and what I feel very strongly about is that when we're in a public space where our voice carries, that we choose our words. Again, you can have strong feelings, you can disagree, you can take different points of view. Um, but I just think the words that have been used, uh, I don't agree with, you know, and Alan can take a different view uh, to my comments right now, and I suspect he will, but I just reckon you can make your points without having to use those references at all. And you can see the reaction from advertisers. They say they're not going to cop it anymore, and they're they're a number of them, I understand, have, have basically pulled out in the last 24 hours, and I suspect more will. James, what do you make of this? I share Ed's sentiments. I've been worried for some time about the coarsening of our public debate and the lowering of the tone in the way that we disagree. As the PM has said, our task is not to disagree less, but disagree better. Uh, and sadly, I think it's partly uh, exacerbated or fuelled by social media, where uh, routine abuse and personal attacks uh, that journalists receive and politicians and other people in public life um, has just become the norm. And I think, sadly, it's seeping into more of our mainstream media as well. But all of us have a responsibility collectively to lift the tone and improve the quality of public debate because there are big issues at stake and we can disagree about those without resorting to that kind of language. Well, one thing you can be certain of is when you come on afternoon briefing, both of you are safe of any of that kind of language from me. That's uh, a relief. I will ask hard questions. Well, I'm safe from the language, but the questions. <laughs> uh, yes, the language, though, I'm safe on. All right, let's just talk about religious freedoms or, or religious discrimination. <laughs> so to another easy subject. Uh, another okay. easy subject. Look, we know that Cabinet is discussing this today. That's been confirmed absolutely looking at uh, the proposals by Christian Porter who's the Attorney General on what this bill may look like. James, Catholic Archbishop of Melbourne Peter Cominsoli told the Australian newspaper that any new laws must be positive protecting religious freedom as a universal human right. What do you make of this? Clearly they're not satisfied that what the government might come up with here is, is good enough. I'm a big supporter of religious freedom, Patricia. I think it's one of our most cornerstone important freedoms in any free society, but I don't agree with the approach uh, outlined by the Catholic Church is the right one uh, to address this issue. There are real dangers in positively enshrining rights in law. Uh, liberals like me have been opposing bills of rights for many years because of the way at which it takes away power from the parliament and hands it to the judiciary. And I think conservatives in particular should be wary about doing that. And they're naive, I think, if they expect that that will result in better outcomes than what they're getting currently. Uh, I think a much better approach is the approach that uh, the government is clearly favouring with an orthodox discrimination act, which will ensure there is space in public, in the public square and in public life for people of faith to express their views safely uh, and not to be uh, have detrimental action taken against them as a result. So Ed Husick, let's just talk about one angle which might be, you know, gay students became a big issue before the election. It's gone a bit quiet. Let's see how it will be resolved in this legislation. Uh, what kind of protections might they get? Uh, will a religious school have the right, for instance, to uh, kick them out? Or how does this pertain to g gay teachers? How will this work in terms of what's been potentially proposed here by the government? First thing is, we don't know what the government's proposing yet. They well, haven't really... Well, they they don't, we, we know something, though. We know no, that no, no. they want Ooh. to have a very similar... Yeah, I'll let you finish, <laughs> and then I'll explain. You and I, you and I often have our robust discussions on... <laughs> um, 
Uh, well, I just want to make a point. We don't know in entirety what the government's going to do because we haven't had the details. So to answer that type of question is difficult. But what I can tell you, Patricia, talking with schools in my area, faith-based schools in my area, is they don't want to do that to kids. Uh, and what they have said, and this is the intersection between, you know, if I can bring up the Israel Folau matter, and in terms of schools, you know, schools have said, you know, we operate in a faith-based environment where we provide education, you know, within that, that environment. Um, we hire people from different backgrounds, knowing their different backgrounds, different faiths, different um, sexuality as well. They're quite upfront about it. But they say we want, um, you know, the instruction, the, the education, religious instruction to obviously follow uh, within the confines of our faith. And we can't afford to have someone come in you know, in the case of, say, someone who is an atheist going in and disparaging the faith and claiming that the religion um, holds no value, uh, this is the intersection, too, of employment law about how you uh, deal with that within a faith-based environment. So, uh, you know, some of the uh, elements of what uh, James was saying, I think a lot of conservatives should listen to about, you know, thinking carefully through uh, what what is happening here. And I think this is the broader thing in terms of the, the debate that some people have rushed to take a particular position without thinking all the elements of it. And, you know, I've got to say, uh, uh, I, uh, as a political candidate, love the notion of uh, religious freedom. I would have loved to have seen it 15 years ago when I had people campaign against me on the basis of my faith. But having said that, what a world that we've come to 15 years fast forward uh, where this is being said now. I think people should be able to express their faith, uh, support their faith. Uh, and others who don't necessarily come from a faith background should be given the space to live their lives as well. James, the Australian National Imams Council has urged the PM to tackle Islamophobia in the new religious discrimination laws, citing comments made by uh, Nine's Sonia Kruger in 2016. Do you think that's a good idea? Uh, well, this issue, the legislation will absolutely tackle discrimination against people of all faiths, uh, Muslims included, uh, but I don't believe it will or should include any new prohibitions on speech about faith, and I think that's very, very important. Uh, certainly there are prohibitions, existing prohibitions, like Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, which do have limits on vilification on the basis of race, but not religion, and there is a reason for that, uh, and that is that faith is different uh, to race. Uh, faith is something that you can change throughout your life, faith is something that you can leave, uh, and in in order to do that, we need to have complete, free and open debate about faith. We need to have un unrestricted debate about faith. And my concern of any new vilification provisions about faith is that it would effectively amount to a blasphemy law in Australia and make it unlawful to criticise people's faith or offend people on the basis of faith. And that would really limit the public debate that we have about faith. And I think that would be a backward step. Ed Husick, what do you think of this proposal from the Imams Council? Uh, well, just before I get to that, I just have to ask James then, why are we talking about all this? I mean, we're talking about making sure that the religious freedom's in place. Um, and if I listen to your answer, and you can correct me if I've misinterpreted what you said, you've said that people should be entitled uh, to be criticised on the basis um, of their faith. And uh, I think uh, I'm not urging that we prevent, you know, we should have open discussion and it should be done uh, on the caveat of respect uh, and not inflaming and vilifying and uh, encouraging division, but it does raise that question. And in terms of the Imams Council um, and what they've said, you know, there, there has been a number of instances, and I've called, I've called it out, and I've spoken with yourself, Patricia, about it in times past, where people have felt that they can get away with Islamophobic comments, and there has been a normalisation of some of that extreme speech that I don't think helps in building stronger, cohesive communities. So should the laws address it, Ed Husick? My preference. You know, I, I get asked about do we need to have, have laws in place. I, I wish we didn't have to. I, would, I think it's important that the community standard that can be um, strengthened and supported by us either as parliamentarians, the media or other people whose voice carries in the public square to be able to express views in a way that doesn't uh, push people apart. And this is the big challenge in public life right now. It seems to be, and I've said previously, that you know, the reward system seems to be stuffed up. You know, if you say an extreme view, your voice carries, uh, but the ones that try to bring people together don't. And you know, you know, unregrettably, you know, we get to a point where we consider laws uh, to provide for that protection when really our better nature should provide the better, better protection and a much, much stronger commitment to respect 
and listening to other views would be uh, would be helpful as well. So James, uh, I just want to get some clarity on your mm. view there. You're saying if I wanted to say something, I don't know, mean about Catholics or Muslims or something, um, I wouldn't. I think that would be a waste of time and a silly thing to do. But if I wanted to, you think that I should have the right to say it, that the law shouldn't stop me? Freedom of religion does not include uh, the freedom from criticism of religious beliefs or practices. In fact, I think it's essential to have that complete free, to spe free speech about faith in order to have religious freedom. I I'm a person, I'm agnostic personally, I don't have faith, but uh, if I want to take up faith or change my faith or if someone who is born into a faith wants to leave their faith, they can only do that by hearing and participating in the debate in public about faith, the, the merits and criticisms of their faith. Um, that's how people reaffirm and change their views about these things and restricting that process I think would lead to diminished religious freedom as well as other diminished freedoms. All right, I just want to move on to this debate. I know it's a New South Wales debate. We're a national program. People are watching all over the place including in New South Wales but the abortion debate it's I know that the the vote has now been delayed. We've even got the intervention of Barnaby Joyce. I'll start with you Ed Husick who's made um, these calls, these robo calls. I called them robo debt calls the other day. I got a bit confused uh, but they're just robo calls. Uh, does, do you think that's appropriate? What do you make of that intervention? Uh, asking me to yeah, talk about a federal parliamentarian that's well, I'm getting trying to involved give it a federal in New angle. South yep. Wales. <laughs> nice try. Nice try. I, uh, look, uh, you know, Barnaby has done a lot of things in the, the last few weeks that make people raise their eyebrows and question uh, and ask why. Um, and I suspect he'll keep doing it. Um, and what's your uh, view on the on the law reform before the New South Wales Parliament? Uh, well, again, it's a New South Wales based law. I mean, I, I speak as someone who's pro-choice, right? Like, so I'm looking at, uh, uh, I'm not walking away from that. But it's a New South Wales law, and uh, you know they're obviously uh, dealing with it uh, in their own way. Um, uh, we do need to, uh, you know, in terms of people, you know, we have to go through that difficult decision of uh, of going through. Uh, and making the choice to have an abortion, you know, you can't, you know, in terms of decriminalising it is important. You know, it's hard enough without having the weight of that that law uh, upon you. But, um, you know, again, we've just mentioned it a few moments ago, being able to have the debate in a respectful way, particularly with something as sensitive as this, um, would go a long way. James, what's your perspective? I have to confess, Patricia, I'm not really across the details of the legislation. A, well, being you are a federal, Victorian senator. Yeah, being in the federal parliament and from Victoria. Um, but in the case of Barnaby Joyce, I think he's free to participate in the debate about that as he wishes. Um, how successful that will be or how persuasive that will be, only time will tell. All right, just quickly on industrial relations before I let you go. James, three of your colleagues have today argued uh, for the case for industrial relations reform. They say the current IR system isn't delivering against its stated objectives. Do you agree with them? Do you think there needs to be a big reform on industrial relations? Well, I'm not sure they would describe it themselves as big, but I strongly support uh, what Tim Wilson, Jason Falinski and Andrew Bragg outlined today in the Financial Review. What they point out is that the Fair Work Act, uh, enacted by Julie Gillard, I don't think is working as intended. It's really undermined the enterprise bargaining system, and that's come, I think, at the expense of an efficient uh, industrial relations system. Enterprise bargaining is not a um, radical right-wing project. It was introduced by Paul Keating, but the number of EBAs has halved in the last five years and there's a flight back to awards which just don't offer businesses or employees or unions the same opportunities to negotiate uh, in ways that suit each workplace. So I think um, they've raised a really good issue today. And Ed Husick, what do you think? Uh, of course these laws uh, were basically created by the, the Gillard government. Are they still working? Uh, it's not, you know, I, I take a completely different view. Uh, it's not, uh, it's easy to blame the laws but let's Take it back a step. Treasury asked CEOs, you know, in the next 12 months, are you going to be prepared to pay a wage increase? And 40% of them said no. So if you're going into enterprise bargaining discussions with that mindset, uh, plus after the RBA says it would be probably a good idea for public sector wage increases to lift uh, to help try and stimulate wages of growth that has been completely anemic in the Australian economy, the government rules that out as well. And I am genuinely concerned about this double whammy that's happening where there isn't a wages policy, there is not a game plan other than crossing fingers and hoping in each federal budget that wages will increase over the coming 12 months, and they don't. Uh, we have no wages policy. We have ginger groups within the coalition that argue for things like penalty rate cuts that lower take-home pay. 
And on top of that, uh, when consideration is given to increasing superannuation down the track, the argument comes from the same Liberal MPs that don't have a wages plan. We can't lift superannuation because people aren't earning enough wages. So pre-retirement, people are dudded. Post-retirement, people are dudded. And we've got no game plan to actually stimulate the economy through wages. And I think this is a, a real problem. And tinkering around with enterprise bargaining, I think business will be its own worst enemy, Patricia. If they can't come up with good wage outcomes in those agreements, you will see the move more to the award-based outcomes and centralised wage fixing that will deny businesses the flexibility offered by enterprise bargaining and we need government and business to get on with fixing a broken system, I think. James, just a quick answer from you. We've only got 30 seconds left, but just on, on a wages policy, does Ed Husick make a point, a good point, that there actually isn't a coherent policy for getting wages moving in the country? I was pleased that Ed conceded at the end of his answer there that we do have a broken system. It's a system that was devised um, by Julie Gillard as Deputy Prime Minister and Industrial Relations Minister and it has not been changed since. And I think now is the time to look at how we could change it to make it work better because we shouldn't have the number of EBAs halving in five years. There's something clearly wrong there. We need to address it. Uh, if anyone thinks that the Coalition's going to fix a system to deliver increased wages, well, good luck. I suppose they're in government, we're going to have to see what, uh, is what they come up with because there is, uh, I'll let uh, viewers know too, there is actually an industrial relations review by the Minister. Uh, so we will see Christian Porter's in charge of that. Thanks to both of you for coming in.